All right, go, go. That's tomorrow, and that is it. That's tomorrow, and that is it for us today. And we will leave you with a... I can't do it. We'll do it live. We'll do it live! Fuck it! Do it live! I can, I'll write it, and we'll do it live! Fucking thing sucks! That's tomorrow, and that is it for us today. I'm Bill O'Reilly. Thanks again for watching. We'll leave you with Sting and a cut off his new album. Take it away. What's up, everybody? It is your boy, Lou Martinez, a.k.a. Big Chief Burrito, live with you on a Tuesday. Fireside Chats with Big Chief Burrito. Getting back into this podcast streaming thing. Uh, today, very happy to have a guest for us that we're going to talk about. A couple of things. We're going to talk about TV, the new TV landscape. But we're going to do a little bit of a, I don't know if it's a deep dive, but at least a shallow dive into the show that just finished on HBO, The Mayor of East Easttown. Um, which is a show that caught me off guard, caught a lot of people off guard. So I try to find people that have similar tastes or similar interests. And I found somebody from the Film Posers podcast. Her name is Gabriela Burgos. She's going to be on with us in a second. And we're going to sit down and talk a little bit about the show. Uh, so thank you very much, everybody, from jo for joining us so far. If you have any questions, comments, let us know what your favorite part about the mayor of Easttown was so that we can address it during our breaks. But without further ado, let's bring on Miss uh, Gabriela Burgos. Hi. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. I know you guys uh, do a lot of podcasts, so it might be old hat, but I don't know how yeah. many of those you guys do live. Mm -hmm. Oop, go ahead. No, hey, we can improv here. That's fine. Uh, as she answers her questions that are off stream, we're going to quickly remind you that uh, if you guys are following us to make sure that you are watching us today via live on Facebook to follow us on facebook.com slash 2am burrito. Also remember you can watch us on Twitch TV dash 2am burrito and then youtube.com slash 2am burrito. Uh, as always, I like to promote the brands and companies that I work with that I associate with that I think are great. And one of those is called community through hope. .org. They're a local organization here in San Diego and Chula Vista that help out people that are in homeless situations. I also recommend that you follow and take a look and listen to Arts for a Better, Arts for a Better Tomorrow, Arts T, Arts BT .org. It's an organization led by a good friend of mine, um, Jose Yenke, who is promoting learning and uh, post-traumatic stress relief and uh, dealing with stress through the arts. Also, if you are in California and you need a dog, do not go to buy dogs from breeders. Instead, go to wesavethepuppy.org, wesavethepuppy.org. They are doing great work here in San Diego and Tijuana, rescuing dogs off the streets, etc. And as we wait for Gabriela to become available... Uh, there Sorry she is. about that. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> it's all right. I improvised and I did all my all my promo stuff. So no, 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 no worries. No worries. Uh, as I was saying, um, you you guys do a lot of podcasts. Um, you got you're part of one of the I guess newer up and coming pods that that. 
that are important because, um, you know, I had Rosa from Rosa's Reviews on. Yeah. Um, I've had a couple of other people and I want to sort of promote Latino Latinx uh, content creators like yourselves. And you guys are sort of newish to the scene, but I, I was talking yeah. to one of your other uh, com uh, compatriots that, uh, that I love the film poser's name. Uh, because one of the, when I was just uh, starting off, I had a, a, a high eight camera and I had a real high concept idea for a movie called Posers, which was a mockumentary about people who pretended to be cool and how hard it was. So it was all about like uh, posers, scenesters, people like that. And it was just like mockumentary style, like, you know, stuff like that. So uh, it's a throwback to, to one of my first films. So I wanted to welcome you on the show once again. Yeah. So. The name started out as kind of like a joke okay. in a way because it, it all started when I got blocked on Twitter. And you know, you I, get called a poser, yeah. <laughs> okay. It wasn't me specifically, but we were all called posers, okay. and, and uh, yeah, so the name just stuck. I like, I like it, it it's dope, yeah. So, self-deprecating but it still it gives a point and no, yeah like the point of the film posers is you know that ev and like every liking any type of film is okay you know there's no need for you to like a certain type of film to you know because sometimes in film twitter specifically they say like oh if you like these types of films like right valid Mm -hmm. or you know oh you have to watch these films in order for you to be considered you know like a valid film critic and we're not like that like one secret that we all carry is that we have never seen the godfather oh my god you know it's like it's like when somebody asks me like my my five favorite movies and I just feel so cliche that Godfather 1 and 2 are there <laughs> along with like, you know, like Goodfellas and Heat for me. And so I'm like, just ask me my top 10 because there's a little bit more of a diverse group in there. It, it almost mm -hmm. feels like it's a cheat code to say those. So so that that's fine. Do you, is it, go ahead. There's no shame in liking The Godfather. Right. And again, there's no shame and not liking The Godfather. It happens. Like, not everyone's going to like the same films. But at this point, do you not watch it just because you want to keep that cred? No, I've, I've never watched it because I just, I've never watched it. I don't have an excuse. I just never have. Will I watch it in the future? Probably. Mm -hmm. But I'm, I'm in no rush. Okay. That's yeah. That's and yeah. And also, again, how, you know, the film criticism world is always, you know, is, like, gatekept by white cis men. Mm -hmm. And so, obviously, we, as all of us are from Puerto Rico, we're all Latinos, we have, obviously, different perspectives due to, like, where we grew up and how we grew up. And so, that's also a very important perspective to have. And so, you know, we've only been doing this for a year and a half and we have reached a very wide audience. And, you know, it kind of gives you hope in that the industry is allowing for, you know, more critics of different backgrounds to be able to have access to a lot of stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Just as important it is for people like myself and other creators to put movies and films out there that are mm -hmm. from a diverse voice and for people to understand. And this is one thing I run into, which is I'm a Latino filmmaker, but I'm more in the like uh, Kevin Smith kind of vein of like kind of like you know, just kind of humor and stuff like that. I like to make comedies. I like to make people laugh. So people do like, why, why aren't you making stories about immigrant children crying? You know, not everybody has to make those types of movies because yeah. you're Latina, you know? So just like we get, just like we need more voices and we need uh, Hollywood to allow us to work in different genres. They also need people to review those films that look like us, right? Yeah. Because if, if 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 I'm making a movie but the white guy's reviewing it, or if 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 the white guy's making a movie and then you you know it's not it's going to be a little bit yeah. of a disconnect. And and part like, of the reason with, I go ahead within, within the within the heights, how you know if there was this whole to make sure that Latinx critics got the chance to see it because it's a story about you know Latinos and a community that's mostly Latinos, so obviously those people should have priority and should have a voice in saying their thoughts about this film. And I think it, it, they've done a pretty good job. I've seen a lot of Latino critics and people of color in general having the chance to review this film. 
that brings up a funny, interesting anecdote before we jump into the show, which is yesterday, out of the blue, now this is somebody local to my area that, that works on a, on a TV station that I know peripherally, but I've never spoken to. And out of nowhere, they sent me a message saying, hey, ha- would you like to go see the Heights and then do an interview about it on Monday? And my first thought was, sure, free screening, I'll go. And then I was like, wait a minute, why do you, and then I, I was just, I just, my thought process went to like, this is a, a white lady, uh, and she does a podcast, and she talks about movies and stuff, and I was like, okay, is this like a genuine, let me get some Latino feedback about this film, or is it, let me think of a couple of Latinos that they know, so that when I do this review, it doesn't sound so, you know, the, it, does that ever enter your mind of why the reason people are doing things, whether it's genuine or whether it's because they feel they have to, and does it make a difference? Hmm. I don't know. Because um, for us, we've actually seen the film many times already. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it hasn't come out yet because we ha- we got re- we received a screener. We were also invited to another screening and another screening. So we've gotten the chance to see it multiple times. And all of the times, you know, it felt genuine. Like I didn't sense that there was anything wrong with how we communicated with the people that, you know, made it happen for us. So I don't know. Maybe there might be people who are who are. Yeah. Doing it's hard it to know what's in somebody's heart and why they're doing it, right? But but you also have to like take it at face value and not overthink everything, right? Exactly. That, like I never. Kind of... no, okay. Right. Right, I will go. I will go into it with an. I'm excited to see the film, and and, yeah, and I was. It's a great film. So yeah. So for me, it's like, and then the other aspect is like, oh, you know, the Latinidad and and the and the separation of like the you know Mexican culture and Puerto Rican culture culture and Colombian culture and mm-hmm. how that all you know and whether we need films that sort of blend all that in together or whether we need those individual stories and I think the answer is both why not both yeah. why what why, why can't we have a movie in the Heights that celebrates uh, you know upper uh, uptown culture Puerto Rican Dominican Colombian etc and then there's also a bunch of films that, that celebrate West Coast Chicano culture. Obviously, I'm a Colombian living in San Diego, surrounded by Mexicans. So, you know, and I grew up in New York, surrounded by Colombians, Ecuadorians, Puerto Ricans, everything. So yeah. I, I love all, all our Latino, Latina brothers, Latinx, whatever, whatever, everything, everybody. So the, the fact that we're sitting here having a conversation about Latino films being made is a good start. But obviously, you know, there needs to be more representation. Yeah. Obviously. So now yeah. let's talk about so now let's talk about a show that's ninety nine percent white. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good segue. That's a, that's a good segue. I did check I did check to see if there was any Latinos in Pennsylvania and there are some. So I did my I did my research there, although they weren't re, they weren't rep, New York, Connecticut, New Jersey, they're all right there, full of Latinos. I thought for a second. Maybe there's no Latinos in Pennsylvania. Maybe it's maybe it's me that that doesn't understand. <laughs> How did you feel about that specific aspect? I don't know. I just thought since it was a very small town, you know, it was probably like a very affluent neighborhood. <laughs> There's still those. It's probably it. <laughs> <laughs> you know. The show is so good. We're gonna give it sort of a pass on that part of it right <laughs> right now. Right now. Okay. This is uh, <laughs> my thing. Is always. It, Make the show that you want. Obviously, I just I just like it when people at least I say make, at the end of the day the movies that you you if you're if you're putting out a product that's a movie a TV show it's your art you can make the decision to to cast it any way you want. Mm-hmm. Just think about those choices. I guess is all we ask people and just you know does this person have to be white? Does this you know just kind of look into it like that. Mm-hmm. Um, but let me let's jump right into it. Obviously, HBO is no, it's it's not TV, it's HBO, right? That's what they yes. say. They are no, they, you know, back in the day, it was The Wire, it was The Sopranos, it was Sunday Night Prestige TV, and 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 this is this is a Sunday night show that that sort of took off like very quickly. As I told you, I was just one day Sunday, and I caught like the, the last part of episode one, and I was like, oh, this is kind of interesting. And then I saw that right after it, episode two was playing. I was like, oh, this is a new show. And they're, they're catching us up. So I watched the second episode. And then I was like, where's the third episode? Where's the third episode? Nope. You got to wait another week. So you put your, so that's, that's the first thing. Binge versus weekly. What, how do you feel in general about those 
two different types of sort of presentations of a show. And do you feel that it served Mayer well in, in, in that sense? You know, I grew up with the weekly format. Every single TV show I watched growing up was the weekly format. And, you know, there were commercials. You couldn't fast forward commercials. You know, I didn't even have a DVR. So that really wasn't an option. So you just have to sit there at the exact time that the show premiered. And that's it. Like you had to stay there the entire time. Or you had to be a baller and have the uh, VCR where you could program the TV guide codes. Oh. That's if you were a super baller because you could just program in and put the VCR tape in and it would record it for you. That was the old Never school DVR. Never had that. But me neither. I just know that it existed. Yeah. So I grew up and did it suck, you know, when the show ended on a cliffhanger and you had to wait an entire week or sometimes they were like, hey, turns out we're going to come back in two weeks. Or yeah. hey, we're going to. Or it's the the classic, the mid-season finale. The mid-season cliffhanger. God, oh. Those things were torture. I mean, they still are because I still watch some shows live, like Grey's Anatomy. I still watch Grey's Anatomy weekly. Okay. So I, I was, so that weekly format, it doesn't bother me. I enjoy it. I use, I'm used to it because, you know, it gives you time to think and to digest what you just saw. Because... You know, some people were being like, oh, my God, I wish I had all the episodes of Mayor of Easttown right now. And yeah, I wish, too. But at the same time, didn't you like, you know, waiting and formulating your theories as to what was going on? You have more time to think. And people on social media would open up discussions and people could, like, discuss their theories. Kind of like the same thing with WandaVision. Right. That I think WandaVision was kind of like the show that kind of showed you know, brought back how, you know, helpful the weekly release format is for some shows. Because, you know, had they released one division all in one day, people would have stopped talking about it in a week. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And you have shows that I think, well, here, the Netflix model, and and, and I think they're going to be hesitant to admit that they want to change it, is like, here's the entire show at once. But I think a show, for example, like The Ozarks, where some of the episodes end in these very dramatic moments mm -hmm. is a show that definitely would have benefited from a weekly release because, like you said, it allows you to build up theories. It allows you to sort of think about what just happened. It allows you to just sort of sit with that episode for mm -hmm. a couple of days, rewatch it even. Oh, they're playing it again on Tuesday, right? But, yeah. but when you have the ability to just next episode, it's like yeah. instant resolution. In instant like you like like you said we used to have to wait three months sometimes for like a summer cliffhanger or a, or a fall or you know last episode in november there's no new episode until after thanksgiving and christmas and then we gotta wait till right so i i, th I think like a, a show like the ozarks is a show that probably could have benefited a lot from that so but but orange is the new black also a show but like we still love the bins because at 1201, whenever a new BoJack season would come on on Netflix at 1201, I wasn't I wasn't going to bed until five in the morning until I watched every episode. So do you think that some of it's like feeding the monster that is our need to consume media? Yeah. So it's almost like 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 a baby, like like they they need to like parse it out, save us from ourselves, so to speak. Right. Yeah. I mean, I really like how. Amazon has also been doing weekly releases. They did that with Invincible. <clears throat> and they started doing that with the new season of The Boys. Because the first season, they just released all the episodes all at once. And then the second season, they just did the weekly release. And also with Invincible. And again, it worked. Because it, especially with those types of shows that got really dark. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, if you were to binge a show like The Boys in an entire day, it would be rough. Because right. I don't know if you've seen it, but it's, you know, very violent and it has, you know, a lot of difficult themes. So I think it's a show that benefits from, like, the, from the weekly release. And also something I wish that had been done was that they had released Bar Barry Jenkins, The Underground Railroad, in a weekly format rather than just all 10 episodes. And do you feel that... Well, that do you think it's because of the gravity of the episodes? Because of like, you know, to, to yeah. give you more time to breathe or because of the story? Both. Because, the mm -hmm. you, know, it's, it's, you know, it's a show about slavery and that subject matter is rough. And the show is really good. Like, it's a great show. But, you know, I feel that 
it lost the momentum that it could have had because, you know, a lot of people saw it in a weekend and that's it. Like, no one's talking about the Underground Railroad anymore. They talked about it when it was released and no one else is talking about it. And what I have seen is that people have been saying that it should have been a weekly format because, again, you, you because after that first episode, I had to take a break. I couldn't go straight into episode two. I had to take a break and then I watched episode two the next day. So it's a show that needed that format because it would give people time to breathe and process what they just saw. And then, you know, every week they would watch one. And even if they wanted to wait and like watch two episodes at a time, they could do that. But it's a show that would have benefited a lot from the weekly release format. And Mare definitely benefited from that. Yeah. So I think what we should do is make you the czar of TV weekly versus binge releases so every time they get a show is about to come out they send it to you and they're like what do you think abby weekly or all at once and then you get to decide but also here i am very grateful that netflix releases lucifer in its entirety the same day because i just sit and watch lucifer all day so really is what do you um should i watch lucifer is that a really good show do you think i mean i got into it because i literally had nothing else to watch during covid so my friend was like i think you'll like it and i was like you know, at this point, what else am I going to do? So I would start watching it, and I really like it. It's fun. It's what's on your, fun. what's like on your Mount Rushmore of TV shows? Like the typical would be like Sopranos, The Wire, stuff like that. What, what's, what's on yours? My favorite TV show of all time, mm-hmm. The X-Files. <laughs> okay. All right. Mulder and Scully in the house. I like, I like that. Like that. Yeah. Yes. Really- the X-Files followed by 24. Okay. 24 um orphan black okay. God, which, doctor who but i sometimes don't say doctor who because it's a show that's still going on so i like to mention shows that already ended so it's those three are like my those are those are those are your go-tos can you can you like revisit them like in it's do you because i mean for example like every few years i'll rewatch the sopranos i'll go back episode one and just sort of rewatch it skip a couple of things that i don't like do a rewatch I, i'm you know i there's a couple of shows like that that i'll that i'll watch but do you are they familiar to you do you do you or you just they, they live in your memory or do you revisit them often so the thing is that at least with 24 i tried to rewatch it from the very beginning and I had I have only seen it once in its entirety, mm. and that was I watched it. I was way too young. <laughs> like, Imagine that they released the full season of Twenty Four. Like you said, people would stop watching it after a week because it's one of those things where every episode leaves you on a cliffhanger. Tint, tint, yeah. Tint, 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 yeah. Tint, tint. And then you're like, oh, resolved. Yeah. Next yeah. episode. Yeah. So I I actually didn't watch Twenty Four when it was airing. I watched it when it was on Netflix years ago. Okay. So I you, did like the whole thing. Anyway. I would go to bed at five a.m. So you did get you did get to watch a show that we watch on a weekly basis. Yeah. I guess that that's it. I guess that's yeah. Breaking Bad as well for some people as well. Yeah. We had to watch and then it's. But you know, twenty four. I tried to. I re- rewatched the first season and then I couldn't continue watching season two. I don't know why. I think it kind of lost its charm. Mm. You know, because I know what's gonna happen. I remember a lot of the things that happened. So I'm just like, I already know who's the traitor this season. So I don't know. I think it's a show that I I don't think I can revisit. I rather just let it live in my memory with the surprises that it took for me the first time. And with the X Files, I never rewatched it again in its entirety. Like I just rewatch my favorite episodes. Okay. Or whatever episode I feel like watching. And Orphan Black, I have seen it completely through like twice yeah like twi- yeah twice i really like orphan black do you feel that the fact that mayor kind of hit this hard when it came out and every and it, and it generated this buzz basically six weeks of buzz for hbo six weeks of buzz for the cast um do you feel that that's going to make executives sort of rethink the binge versus weekly model I don't know. Mare is not the first show to do the weekly release. You know, no, we have Invincible. I mean, Wanda. Invincible, WandaVision, Falcon and the Winter Soldier. You know, and HBO has been doing the weekly re- release. That's what they do. They do weekly re- releases. They have. They never release their TV shows all at once. You know, Game of Thrones. Right. It, it was 
no That's almost 10 soon. years too, too soon too soon too soon i okay. tried to talk about it a little bit more <laughs> to like heal <laughs> Too soon. <laughs> they gave us they gave us six seasons worth of, of, of things, and they're like, we're just gonna wrap it up. We're that that, that didn't mean anything. She sort of forgot yeah. about the fleet. It's it's a whole, it's, it's a whole, it's a whole thing. But, I mean, but, you know, season. You know what better bus for HBO than when they made us wait two years for season? Oh my eight. god, two years, right? And in those two years, how many new fans you know watched the show? Because they were like, oh, and because obviously Game of Thrones wasn't aired, but people were talking about it. Because again, it would it that show had a cultural impact, and then after season eight, that was lost. But before season eight, no show has lost has lost its impact on 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 the TV landscape faster than Game of Thrones did Honestly. from episode like four to six. I just like, remember when season eight was airing. I, I have my, one of my friends got HBO just to watch it, you know, live on Sunday. And so she gave me her password so that we could watch it together. And as soon as episode, as the last episode finished, she she texted me. She's like, I'm canceling the account right now. <laughs> and right now, recently, because of HBO Max, they're trying to get people to sign up to binge it. And they're like, hey, remember this show? And they, were, they had that whole campaign about the God, the 10-year like, anniversary. It's like you were oh, good okay. ones. Because I... Mean, I, I I still stand by Battle of the Bastards being one of my all-time favorite TV episodes. Like okay. that, I, I will never not say that that episode is gold. And yeah, if if you finish that series with, uh, I think it was the the end of season five or season six, where with Daenerys on the boats heading out and the dragons was, flying over her. No, I think you could have just just watched until the wall is destroyed. <laughs> Just stay yeah, there. I guess that's season seven. I guess, but I'm just saying, no, like, the wall was destroyed in season six. Season it, six. It was season six. I don't know. It gets so muddy at the end that it's hard. But I just remember oh, the yeah. scene of like I think it was the end of season five or the end of season six where she was on the boat. Oh and, yeah, that uh, was with Melisandre, and then yeah. the dragons were over there, and they were. She yeah. was like, they're like, they're on, yeah. they're on their way. They're, she's yeah, on the way. She, she... Then in season seven, they make it to Dragonstone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if, yeah. if the show ends right there, it's like, ah, okay. Glory. Stuff, ha stuff happens. Yeah. And know? like the season six finale was amazing. You know, the whole Absolutely. sector blowing up, the reveal yeah. of Jon yeah. Snow. You know, it was a great episode. Yeah. Me Meanwhile, that, that ended up meaning absolutely nothing. God, so. I was so <laughs> pissed. I was so pissed because I remember, because I was the first of my friends to watch Game of Thrones and I started watching it like right after season three finished. And so I kept telling my friends, hey, watch the show. What watch the show until they finally got tired of me and they watched it. And so I spent so many years telling them about the whole Jon Snow theory and they didn't believe me. I spent yeah. years and they're like, You're reaching. You're reaching. That's and I'm like, I'm right. I'm telling you, I am right. And when season six happened, like, you know, that's my proudest moment. <laughs> No, I think at the beginning it was book readers versus TV fans, and mm -hmm. the book readers were like, you wait, you wait, and they're like, yeah, 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 and then it gave, the book readers and the film and the TV watchers kind of met up, and then it was like, okay, now we're all in the same boat, we don't know what's happening, and then we were all disappointed together, but, you know, like they should have just stopped it after season six, and they said, okay, go do some other projects if you guys want, and then do a, a second part where you pick it up. I mean, they rushed the ending because they were going they wanted to make a show about the confederacy <laughs> and then they wanted to make a star wars movie and they got fired after they got, fi they got fired from it and if you google if you google horrible writers they they come up still if you google horrible writers cuz I, I i was on the subreddit the the free folk subreddit on reddit where it was just nonstop <laughs> And they made they had this campaign to where if you Google horrible writers, I don't know if it still happens, but if, I'm pretty sure that they come out. Oh uh, my god! They're like, you can have as many episodes as you want. You can take as much. This is our our cash cow. It's making us money. No, we'll we'll just wrap it up in like six episodes. We got other stuff to do. We're just gonna wrap it up. Let's just wrap it up. Oh, anyway, all right. I guess we got into a little segue there. Um, I did want to talk a little bit about uh, WandaVision when it's compared to Mare in terms of the themes of grief and the themes, the over the over kind of reaching themes of WandaVision is a show all about of her dealing with her grief, with her loss. 
not this not not there's not enough there's not as much fantasy in Mare of East Town, but they're also the main character throughout it is and and done different ways, but both very um I wanna say very well done representations in completely different genres about persons that are carrying and dealing with grief. Right? Do you agree? Yeah, I agree. You know, for one division, I was really liking that show, but the episode, yeah, it's like kind of like the episode before the finale where they decided to just do a whole flashback of everything. Right. They lost me in there. I yeah. don't I there was just a lot of showing and they just spoon-fed us everything and it felt like a waste of an episode and then you had the finale and it was like it's almost like we got to get back to our roots. This is a Marvel yeah. show. There needs to be a bad guy. There needs to be a baddie. There needs yeah. to be a, a battle, right? We need to set yeah. up future properties, right? They still yeah. know from whence their bed is buttered. But the first few episodes dealt with oh, it a yeah. lot up, up until that moment, I was loving it. And then they lost me with that episode. And then the trail of breadcrumbs that Mayor of East Town sort of left for us at the beginning. Because it's one of those where if you're like, well, I guess I, if I was paying more attention in episode one and two, I would have seen these things that seem sort of innocuous and I could have put it together. But the yeah. way they laid the breadcrumbs out of her grief, of her family history, it felt a lot more, I want to say, like, uh, like just natural, right? Yeah, definitely. I really, you know, especially that final moment of the show i think it speaks a lot in terms of her grief it was very haunting like i i got chills no no absolutely i think it was very well written um the showrunner for the show uh brad inglesby uh, mm-hmm. one one of the things that i that i noticed about his wikipedia page and this is similar to me, uh <clears throat> He wrote The Low Dweller based on a story after graduating and sent in screenplay to Focus Features executives. Just the origin story of some of these white writers is so funny to me because it's like he had an idea for a show, so he sent it to the guy at this film company and he liked it and he made the movie for him. And that just seems so, like, mind-blowing to me. <laughs> he also wrote the story that has been, which was the movie that, uh, which was the story that the way back with uh, Ben Affleck was created, very similar to Mayor Town, about a small time basketball coach that used to be a basketball star for a small school that becomes an alcoholic somehow has to save the day. So, a lot of very interesting parallels between the way back and Mayor of Easton. Uh, where she was a basketball star. I guess his dad was a basketball coach, so every movie he makes has to have a basketball player in it for some reason. Maybe that's his thing. Um, but uh, but uh, the show is... I'm, not, I'm sort of giving them, you know, being uh, facetious here, but um, how did you feel about the overall structure of the show in terms of, like, the characters? We already said it's all white, all white, all white. But besides that... Oh my god. I I couldn't tell people apart honestly. <laughs> <laughs> I could I only could do Kate Winslet. Okay, yeah, cuz it's Kate Evan, fucking Winslet. Evan Peters being smart and I forgot her name. Uh forgot. her friend. Oh, uh the the, the this jockey. Yeah, like the one that at the end, you know, I don't want to spoil the show, but oh yeah, 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 yeah. oh yeah, yeah, her friend, yes, yes, yeah, absolutely. I forgot her name. Oh my god, those yeah. four. Yeah. Oh, and obviously Guy Pierce, because Guy Pierce, who was that, Mister Mr. McGuffin? Listen, I I issued a public apology to Guy Pierce because for the entire show, I was like, <laughs> you're, gotta serial, be you're a serial killer. <laughs> yeah, and he I, comes in. And I had like a, and I knew it tweet ready. I was so sure it was you him. Had it. I had it on the traps. I was like, ready to tweet it. He did Told it. You. Told you. <laughs> and then I had to issue a public apology to Guy Pierce. Yeah. I call him Johnny McGuffin because he was just there to, you know, oh, hey, they got a, a big guest star. That must mean it's like Kevin Spacey in the seventh type deal. Uh, oh, he's got to be, you know, if you got something like that. Yeah, he goes from town to town. He gets teaching jobs and then he murders young girls. And now he, you know, and Mayor's, Mayor's going to turn to him in bed and put a gun to his head and say, I know it's you. Oh, my God. And I and the, when he talked so much about his book, I was like, Mayor's going to read that book and realize that the murder is very similar to how they found the girl's body. 
Oh, yes. Like I was ready for that to happen. <laughs> what was your favorite? Okay, okay, here. I had a moment weeks. I think it was season, episode f- five. Episode five, everyone lost it. Yeah, I had a, I had a I think it was before the finale, but I had a I had a moment in that episode where because uh, they had set it up before with Gene Smart, the grandma character, mm-hmm. and the the junkie mom, where they're they're giving the kid a bath, and oh, she's like, God. "You got to pay attention to him. You got to da 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 da." And then the next episode, you know what I'm talking about, where they just start showing him in the bathtub. I had a heart attack. I I, I had to, I had a heart attack. Honestly, I had to stop the show. I stopped. I pressed pause and I was like, and I literally got up and I was like, no, 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 no. You're not doing this to me, HBO. You are not doing this right now. I swear to fucking God, if you kill this kid right now, I'm done with you. I had to pause the show and like walk around for like three minutes and like get a drink of water and like stretch out. And I was like, don't look on Twitter. Don't look on Twitter. Don't look anywhere. Don't, don't just, just take a I, I literally that is the first time that a show has made me do that in a very long time where I'm like I don't yeah. you set up this universe where anything could happen you made me believe in this sort of place you've created and you've put me in this place where shit shit might happen at any second and now you're going to show me this cute ass kid and you've already set it up and his mom is dozing off and I was just like I can't and then when they come back and she's and you're like, oh, okay, all right. But that moment for me was like more tense than anything that I've experienced from a TV show in a long time. Yeah, it was. And then the ending of that episode. <sighs> I oh, screamed. God. I full on screamed. I hadn't screamed in a TV show. <sighs> you know, I think that's when everyone who did wasn't on board with this show was like, Oh yeah, the show is incredible with episode yeah. five. Mm-hmm. No, and that, um, and the first thing about that final scene is that, um, you know, it, it, it started off very specifically as sort of a Silence of the Lamb sort of homage mm-hmm. in the way it's set up with the music playing and the weird house and the stuff like that. And it's, and you're like, okay, it seems familiar, but at the same time, it seems like they're not, it's not derivative. It's just, this is, the, it's a similar scene within the vein of it. And I was like, okay, this is cool. But I already saw how this movie ends. I'm like, okay. And it sets you up and it just brings this, it starts adding these levels of tension, of tension, of tension. And the relationship between Mare and, I, I forget his name. Um, uh, well, Evan Peters. Oh, uh, Sable. Uh, yeah, same. Uh, you know, the, the, it's been set up that it's like, you know, and then he has the kiss. Like, How do you know what I want? And, you know, and you're like, oh, hey, mayor. So that entire sequence and you you literally scream. How long did it take you to recover from that? <laughs> <laughs> I, I know I kept tweeting the entire week, like still not over it. Yeah. 48 hours, not o- 72. Nope. nope. Whole, you know, new episode today and I'm still not Was okay. It- was it was it you that posted that I'm googling how you can survive a headshot or something like that or was that somebody else? No, I retweeted that. But <laughs> but googling was... chances of surviving a headshot. Yeah, and then like at the beginning of the episode, you're you like part like I was still holding out hope. My idiot self was still holding out a hope, and it wasn't until in the episode they said, "Oh, you know, Detective Zabel is dead," and I was like, "God damn it." Uh, yeah, and then one of the things that the weekly sort of solution allows people to do is is they schedule media for 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 things that are relevant. So you know they can release interviews with the actor because he passed. You know because he you know he's yeah mm-hmm. it's, yeah it's official he died blah blah blah. Whereas and specifically as well for movie reviewers and TV show reviewers, because I sometimes like I, I'll read the AV Club and other you know recaps and reviews of stuff, and for and even for them it's like let's say you're reviewing a series that's that's a binge series on Netflix, right? It's almost like do you just review the entire series or do you review it episode by episode and release it weekly, even though if it's eight episodes. I don't know if people are going to come back for two months to read your reviews about a show if they can watch it all in one week, right? How do you, as a reviewer, if you're going to do something like that, sort of analyze that process? So for 
us when we because we tend to do more film reviews than tv shows so when we talk about tv shows we mostly do this episodes that are like what we watched recently and so where we're talking about any films or any tv shows that we watched that we want to talk about and so i remember talking about mayor of east town and so what we do is that if it's a tv show and that, that's currently airing so we just say hey like i'm watching you know we talked about invincible we talked about wandavision when they were currently airing we just said like our initial thoughts on it and all that but we don't do like full length reviews of shows mm-hmm. because it's yeah mostly that and also since you know on social media what we also do is that when we finish a show we just like write a general reaction on our social media page and we like post you know this is what we thought in general we did it with WandaVision I did it with Mare of East Town Falcon Winter Soldier so we, we've been doing that also but full reviews I guess it depends because I know a lot of people who discover shows late and then go on YouTube and look up reviews for it because I I think that people will always watch them or hey if someone else wants to wants to revisit them. I was looking up Orphan Black theories the other day, even though I've seen that entire show and I know how it ends, but I still wanted to, you know, listen what people thought, how people thought it was going to go down. So it's something that I, it ha- they have an audience, you know, videos that even if you're not going to get as many views on it as if you were to release it, you know, right when it, it the finale airs, it's people are still going to watch it. It's still relevant, right? Because, yeah. like you said, if we're living in an on-demand world where people are like, "Well, I'm going to watch this season in in eight weeks," even though you might have reviewed each individual episode or the series as a whole when it came out, uh, people are still going to look for that additional content. I often mm-hmm. look up, you know, reviews, uh, even though you just saw a show, you want to see, a, you want to read a recap of it because you want to see how somebody else viewed something that you viewed it's always good to see how other people view things right you it's always good to get fresh eyes on something right excellent okay so gene smart appreciation she's a character actor that's been around for a while uh she's done a lot of different so she gets a little bit more shine uh during this kind of puts her back into the zeitgeist yeah. i guess so to speak how do you feel about her as the as I the love mom? Her. i love her <laughs> And when she had her big comeback in Watchmen, I was living for it. I'm still kind of mad she lost the Emmy. Not gonna lie, for Watchmen. You think she? You think she deserved that? She did. She had a good yeah. job. I think that some of the the best. I guess she was sort of the humor point of the show, right? And uh, you know, yeah. because uh, the the biggest laugh out loud, where, you know, when they reveal the the affair or when she falls, they use her for this dark humor thing, right? Which that is kind of cool. Yeah, which is kind of cool that they that they use her to set up that bathtub scene that comes back a couple of episodes later that freaked me the hell out. Um, and go ahead. And she's currently doing hacks on HBO Max. If you if you've been watching it, she is amazing. She was one of the, she, she's an incredible character actor. She's been around for a while. She's been yeah. in more things that you can remember. And and then yeah, you're like, oh yeah, she was in that. She was in that. She was in that. She yeah. So she's definitely great. Kate Winslet sort of slumming it, uh, it, I guess so to speak, because you first see her in this show. When I first saw her, I was like, wait, is that is that Kate Winslet? Is that what is she? What is that accent that she's doing? Uh, and what is going on? What what is this universe where 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 they've turned Kate Winslet into like a Pennsylvania, like regular cop stuff? Like, like, you know what I mean? Like, um, yeah. I guess casting against type. Yeah. Definitely a role completely different than what she has ever done. And I remember I was I I was like, my God, I'm getting old. When she was when I realized that it was her grandson and not her son. Oh wow, Drew. I was like, is Kate Winslet old enough to already play a grandmother? What the fuck? It feels like she she jumped like ten years at some point, right? I lost it. I was like, God, I need to lie down or something. This is too much. One of the fan theories out there was that uh, Dan Denman, who played her ex-husband, was actually with her after being with Pam from The Office because it was the same actor. So I thought that was an interesting fan theory. The Office also takes place in Pennsylvania. Uh, really? Well, doesn't it? Right? Yeah. Uh, I've never seen it, so I don't know. Okay. Well, he did play. He did play. Uh, um, 
Pam Beasley's uh, husband, uh, David Denham, played it in, in the office. Uh, okay. The other one was the person who played the, um, the one of the priests, um, Neil Huff, yeah. was also played somebody that was molested by a priest in the movie Spotlight. So that was a bit of weird oh, casting. Really? Yeah, because he was in Spotlight and he was one of the guys that 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 they that was, was mm-hmm. one of the sources for the story, one of the people that they spoke to. And then they made him a priest in this show, which I don't know if it's like a, an attempt at like dark humor or like a, a wink, wink, nudge, nudge type deal. I'm, I'm trying to figure out. I don't I'm trying. I'm trying to figure out who this Brad Inglesby is. That he just know. that he just sent his script to Focus Features, and they're like, "Yeah, cool, thanks. Come on, come on in for a, come on in for a meeting, guy. We got you." Oh, yeah. thanks. Oh, to have that sort of confidence. <laughs> let's all approach. Let's all approach our writing and our and our, co- our content creation with the confidence of a white man. Yeah. Let us all and let no, us all no. use that specifically. A mediocre white man. A mediocre white man. All right. Yes, that's. Let's let's go with that one. Let's I, I approach it like the writers from Game of Thrones. <laughs> the the mediocre writers from Game yes. of Thrones, uh, and then the the last thing I wanted to touch with you, but I'll let you bring up anything else that you you thought of about the show was the possibility of a season two. Obviously, no. the show comes up. The show the show the show breaks HBO records and it, it crashes the app. It, it's a fully engaged story, circular beginning to end. It gives us that nice closure at the end. It, it even, and even you might say the last episode almost gives us too much of like, you know, because I'm like, oh, I didn't know you, you didn't have to tell me all this. You didn't have to tell me about this character and this character. And uh, she settles for Guy Pierce. She settles at the end. She's like, hey, I guess, you know, my other boo died. I guess I'm going to go. I'm going to. Go my 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 other boo thing. Do not disrespect Sable's <laughs> name. Well, that was the dude for her. That was the guy from her. She was gonna she was gonna kick Guy Pierce to the curb. Um, absolutely. But I feel like she settles at the end for for the hunky writer who's gonna go away. Um, but but then right away it's like, can season two happen? And HBO came out and said, hey, if he wants to do season two. No, stop we that. We love money. Stop right, but no, right? that. Stop Bad it. Idea. They did the same thing with Big Little Lies, and look what happened with season two. Stop it. <sighs> yeah, can we just appreciate single season, or, or can I we just... I remember well, HBO wanted to do a second season of Watchmen, and to me, Watchmen has been the best miniseries that HBO has released. Like To me, like I, like I love Mayor, but it was nothing like Watchmen. Okay. So, and HBO's like, yeah, season two, let's go. And then the writers were like, no, it's going to like literally lose everything that we said, like, that we did in season one. There's no point to it. The story's done. And HBO was really pissed. HBO, and, yeah. Well, I guess they're like, I don't know if they're learning their lesson from Game of Thrones or if they should learn their lesson from Game of Thrones or what have you. But it's uh, it's interesting that that uh, that now they suddenly want more seasons uh, of shows. But think of it: what would Mayor's of East Town season two be? Her solving another case, right? You know, the point of the show was not only solving the case, but her also dealing with her grief. Right. Yeah, and yeah. the grief is gone. So now she's what a well-adjusted detective in a small town with no Latinos. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. What are we gonna do? Like watching her, uh, or what? Are they going to like bring something up about Sable, mm. or I don't know, do something absolutely horrible and maybe kill her daughter in California, and then her having to go to California to solve Ooh. her daughter's murder? Oh, somebody's pitching that right now in HBO. God damn it! Don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> don't do it. But the point is like, there's. You know, it wouldn't be as good because again, Big Little Lies season two was not good. The directing, he... the directing for season two was much better. I got, I got plot, it. The plot was so boring. Ben Affleck from the way back is a, a rival basketball coach from the other movie, and they come into Pennsylvania to play uh, Mayor's old team. She's in the stand. There's a murder during the game, <laughs> and it was Ben Affleck. Of course, it's gonna be Ben Affleck. You're really gonna bring a star like Ben Affleck and not have him be important? 
He is definitely going to be important. All right, now we're going to go to a segment that I like to call, um, Should I Buy This? So yeah. let's pull that up. Should I buy this mug? I saw Rosa with that mug today. <laughs> I'm giving some uh, some props here to latinxpower.com. Uh, they are a podcast where they interview Latinos, Latinas, Latinx people that are in tech and in the world of business, showcasing Latinx talent around the world. So I wanted to showcase their page here where they have a bunch of cool stuff. Si se puede. They got stickers. They got tote really? bags. They got hats. They got this little Somos Latinx uh, mug, only $15, hot pink. That is with... adorable. Yes. That is pretty good. So I guess the question is, should I buy this towel maybe? I mean, mm. why not? You know, it's summer. You go it to the beach, summer. you're going to need summer. a towel. I live in San Diego. We do need beach. We do. We, I do go yeah. to the beach often. It is one of my snacks. All right. And that has been, should I buy this? All right, give me some of your final thoughts on this show. What did uh, do? You, are there some? I mean, obviously, we touched on a bunch of topics, but what did I miss? What was the most important parts to you, and 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 the parts that kind of affected you the most? Okay, so the thing about it is that I watched The Undoing, which aired last year with Nicole Kidman and Hugh Grant, and so I was really liking that show. And like, I'm very stubborn because I'm really good at guessing who the murderer is, so I just go all out. You know, I I'm really good at guessing, and with The Undoing. I ended going into the finale. I had two theories, and I was right in one of them. So, and that, but then the undoing ended up being very disappointing. I don't know if you watched it, but the, the finale is so disappointing. It is very anticlimactic, and it's like that's it. Like it feels like they ended it mid episode. So I was very disappointed by that show because I was loving it at first, and so going back into Mervis Town, I was cautious because i did not want to be disappointed like i was with the undoing but i also put on my detective hat because again that's what i do and i did not guess who did it in mervis town i missed completely do you I, feel do you, do you feel better because of that do you feel like okay good no that's why i recommend it because i always give it extra points if i don't guess it yeah. I'm like, okay, I, because that's what I say when I recommend detective stories. Everyone is like, oh, I'm, I'm, you guessed it by the end. And when I say no, and that has only happened with this other show called Broadchurch, which is a, which is a British TV show with David Tennant and Olivia Colman. Okay. That's the only other show I've, I haven't been able to guess what it was. Broadchurch? Yeah, Broadchurch. They did oh, an Broadchurch. Yeah, they did an American remake, Don't Bother. I don't watch those. No, I uh, I don't watch remakes. I don't. So, I think the uh, Spike Lee remake of Old Boy is one of the biggest affronts to film in the entirety of film history. I, that should have never been made. That doesn't exist. What are you talking? About? Doesn't I don't I know I I and I don't. <clears throat> I love I love Spike Lee so much, and I'm so disappointed that he made that movie. It's mm-hmm. it's 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 a it's it's, it's all right. Yeah. I still love you, Spike. <laughs> There's always that one movie made by, by, by a director. With me, with Sofia Coppola, I adore Sofia Coppola, but oh my oh. God, did I hate On the Rocks. Mm. You know what I would ask Francis for Coppola if I ever interviewed him? What? When he realized his daughter was a better director than him. Was it right away? Was it after the Virgin was, Suicides? Was, was it, it after? Was it, was it when he had her killed up in Godfather? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, horrible actress. She gets way too much crap for Godfather Three. Uh, obviously, when when people say, "Oh, Winona Ryder was supposed to play that part," well, yeah, I understand it. Godfather yeah. T had a Godfather Three had a lot more problems than just Sofia Coppola, and she is an incredible filmmaker. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I kind of kid that Francis Ford Coppola, but it is close. Like she is, she yeah. could, she she definitely has the skills to surplus. I, I would love for her to remake The Godfather like in twenty years. Oh, it's I just would love that. I would watch it there. <laughs> right, right. <Yeah. laughs> so Sophia Coppola's Godfather. You're like, I'm in. Sign me yeah. up. Weekend <laughs> six hour six hour cut. Um, do you feel that you kind of analyze those scenes? Um, because I'm not. Do you also do you? I mean, I know you guys are, are film lovers, but do you guys also 
I know that you guys write and create films. Do you feel that like that's the writer in you that that kind of has that, or is that just a movie lover in you? I think it's both, because before, yeah, you know, I think I've I've always been a writer, but before I you know took it seriously and that this is what I want to do, I I saw it as more of like a film lover because I would guess it because I've watched so many films and so much TV. You know, I grew up on CSI Miami. So I developed those like detective skills by watching CSI Miami and all of those cases. So yeah, I tend to go by the tropes that are in the genre, but also from the writing perspective, which is how I went with Big Little Lies. So you're Actually, saying CSI Miami. Yes. <laughs> ah! <laughs> I guess we need a I guess we need a new mayor in town. <laughs> ah! I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. I didn't mean to interrupt you, but so the tropes and the shows and stuff. Yeah, so the you, tropes, because even if you as even if you try to be as original as possible, there are still going to be tropes that follow every detective story. Yeah, absolutely. And, and again, like a plot twist, if you guess a plot twist, that doesn't mean it's bad writing. It means that the clues were set up the way they right. were supposed to. So if yeah. you guess so, if you guess it was the guy's brother, I mean that's a tough one to guess, though, right? No, I got again. I had my money on Guy Pierce. <laughs> they threw a bunch of MacGuffins in there, and then they sort of gave you an ending, and then you're like, "Wait a minute, there's then, way too much time left." No, to me, that I knew it wasn't him because there were no flashbacks. They always show flashbacks when they reveal who the killer is. They show how how they did it. And so the, the guy was just talking and there were no flashbacks. I was like, you didn't do it. You're covering for someone. I don't know who you're covering for, but you're covering for someone. Do you feel that like the choice of the actual killer was a little bit lowering the stakes? I mean, for the show to be this good, but then making the decision that the actual physical murderer was, do you feel that that was... I don't want to say a bit of a cop out, but it'd be a bit of a softer yeah. blow, softer landing. Or do you do you, do you I, think it was good? I think it actually made it stronger because come on, are you seriously going to suspect that that person did it? Mm -hmm. Like I, again, it it is a very bold decision to make it that. And the thing is that that was one of my theories on the undoing. I thought the undoing was going to go that dark route because when you think about that that is dark because you know an an adult committing murder or a crime in general yeah they're an adult like they right. make the decision to do that but a child committing murder yeah. like, that's dark and then you're like, all right, he's going to go to juvie. He's going to get out when he's like 18, 19 or something like that. It's like, I don't know if we, I don't know if they charge 14 year olds with murder in, in East I don't Pennsylvania. Know. But I think it's kind of like the impact and also having it be who it was. I think that's also. And then they had those breadcrumbs that they had laid out to you in future episodes because you just see him like in the background crying about something. And then you're like, oh, and then they're like, oh, don't worry about it. That's not about that. And then you're like, oh, OK, mm -hmm. I guess. Your critical eye wasn't really saw no, that. I was like, he's just, just a pass. kid. He's just a kid acting up. Absolutely. Or um, you know, a preteen going through mood swings. We all were his, there. Puberty he sucks. His, he caught his dad cheating. He's yeah, he's in a, yeah. He's that in was a, to me. That was the logical part. That his, his dad was cheating. Obviously, he's upset about it. You know, I didn't really think of much of it. When you think about Mayor of Easttown in a couple of years, you're sitting back and you're like, oh, what are my favorite TV shows? Where do you rank it with your other like top shows, top shows of this era? Where do you think it falls? Hmm. I think I would put it on my list of top miniseries because I, I have like a completely different ranking in terms of miniseries. You're not going to judge it based on like shows with multiple seasons. But... Yeah. It's, yeah, because I think you miniseries are like a six hour long movie. Mm -hmm. While TV shows, you know, it's a whole, it's different. You know, they do multiple things, and and they have more time than a miniseries does. What, uh, do you think, like, let's say two years from now, you're living in New York City, uh, you're you're it's there's a snowstorm, you got nothing to do, you 
bust out your laptop, you got two things you can watch. You can rewatch Mare or you can rewatch WandaVision. Which one do you think will, will, would be more interesting on a rewatch in terms of just passing time, pa- having some fun? Mare. Mare? You yeah. still go back to the serious shows. You're not you're not a big huge Marvel or like a I, sci-fi person. No, I love sci-fi. It's just like again that like the conclusion of WandaVision really frustrated me. They were going somewhere, and I was going like, "Yes, you're doing something different, Marvel. Good for you." And then they just fell back on the. Yeah. They know from when they're like. We need we need some fights. We need a, a baddie, and we need to set up future properties. That is the they, that is and, the, and, yeah. And it's just frustrating me how they were all teasing like oh my. And then I remember how they said because you obviously in one division you had all the commercials, and right. then they end up adding to <laughs> nothing. And then someone said that the commercials originally were supposed to be a message from Doctor Strange to Wanda. And I'm just like, then why didn't you do that? What? Really? Yeah. And I was like, then why didn't you do that? That was <clears> so cool. You ended on like Doctor Strange and you could like cut out a whole different thing. You could have ended it with like Doc- Doctor Strange trying to communicate with her or something like that. I don't know. I feel like Doctor Strange should have had, even if you didn't have like him physically, mm-hmm. but I don't know. They should have had some. Somehow- Wong? Yeah. Anyone. <laughs> anyone. <laughs> Because then the commercials ended up being something to like. I don't know. I don't know. I, nothing. I, I like. I, I just felt like, like you said, they were they were going somewhere with the first few episodes where it was like we're not spoon feeding you, and people were like having fun figuring mm-hmm. it out, and then at some point they're like. Yeah, but let's super explain it and let's go to it. Let's do our thing. Exactly. So I feel like it did. It did take a dive yeah. mid, midway through. Yeah, and I remember I was watching it with my dad, and I actually ended up watching like the the it was it was nine episodes, right? So episode eight, mm-hmm. I actually watched that episode twice, and it annoyed me more the second time because that's when I fully realized that it was a waste of time. That we truly wait you you had nine you have nine hours and you wasted an hour on spoon feeding us information. If you could uh if you could write a sequel to any of your favorite movies, uh what would what would you do? Which one do you write? A sequel to one of my favorite movies? Mm-hmm. Jesus. Or a remake of your favorite movie that they wanted no, you to do. No, remix write. no. Okay, good, good. I could good, never good. do a remake. Good job, good job, good job. Testing think, you there. I think I would write a sequel to Blade Runner twenty forty nine. Really? So Blade Runner three? Yeah. Hmm. I want to see the aftermath of Anna finding out the truth about her heritage, mm. and I want to see the Republican Revolution. Wow! Hey. I want to see that. And, you know, I still cross my fingers because Denis Villeneuve said that he would love to do it. And I'm just you're like, I would watch it. So, you know. Well, if Daniel's too busy, I'll, re- I'll direct. So I'll, I'll put yeah. that up. <laughs> I'm willing. I'm willing. And, I'm, and I can say this because my girlfriend doesn't watch the stream. But if I was in a car and Anna de Armas was waiting for a bus, I would kick my girlfriend out of the car and pick her up. <laughs> so... <laughs> Why don't you can have them both have, you know, maybe just like have your girlfriend sit in the back and yeah, I mean, up in the be, I'd be, that'd be, I didn't think that would be even colder. All right, all right, hey, we're gonna <laughs> pick up out of the armos real quick. Hold on a second. Yeah, she's just come on, she's gonna get in the back. Don't worry about it. She'll be in the back with the dogs. You can come on, sit in the front. Where are you going? Ben Affleck's house. All right, never mind. <laughs> hey, they broke up. I know, I know. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> Just as I'm considering proposing over here, I'm like, oh my god, she's single again. What a minute! We oh have to I'm, just, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Like I said, she doesn't watch the stream. It's okay. She won't. What if she watches this one? She, she watches. Me. Yeah, she'll watch the replay. She'll get mad at me. It'll be all right. I'll buy her some food. She'll be fine. She's. Okay. she's no, she, she understands this is the Louis persona. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I couldn't help it. I, I just. I just think she's one of the most talented and beautiful actresses I've ever yeah. seen in my life. Totally. So. Totally. But yeah, totally. That- I mean, even though I find it a little bit sacrilegious because I don't think I could do it justice. <laughs> but. True. No, no, I, I, I believe. Like, I, w- I wish I could. I, I wish I could. Um, 
I wish I could make Godfather 3 and pretend Godfather 3 never existed because there's all these other stories in the Godfather universe about them going up against like the Colombian cartel and all this other stuff. And even though sometimes I, I don't like to steer into that, like, I, I do know that there's a place for gangster movies and exploitation and stuff in, in cinema as well. So if, you know, if I was going to do one, I'd probably say, let's retcon Godfather 3. It never existed. And I will make the actual sequel. Uh, with a whole new cast. Andy Garcia can be a little bit older Godfather. We can put him in there. That's fine. Yeah. 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 All right. Well, uh, did you have any other thoughts on the show? I, uh, I know that we no. kinda... Overall, right. I loved it. I get, I rated it a five on Letterboxd. I nice. loved it. It was really... And I think, you know, the it definitely stuck the landing, which I was nervous that it wouldn't, but it definitely stuck the landing for me. And, and you know, it was worth it the half hour that HBO Max was down for me. No, I, I saw that you were getting frustrated. I was so frustrated. And my dad, and I just, I kept tweeting about it. And I was posting on my Instagram stories. And my dad saw my <laughs> Instagram stories. <laughs> so he started laughing. And he comes into my room. He's like, everything okay? I'm like, no. <laughs> it was really rough for me. And. Yeah. That was pretty well done, honestly. Yeah. SNL, <laughs> the dirt or murder, even though that was done with during the Elon Musk episode, which was um, oh, that's, that's, no, what, that's why I didn't saw it. Yeah, 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 that was in that. Yeah, that was. Uh, but also that at that point, that was just like after like the third or fourth episode. So that's why they were like, oh yeah, the priest is definitely the killer. Because yeah. when that when like when you saw him throw that bike over the bridge, you're like, yeah, there's no way. No, he's not the killer. I, when, I, when the priest threw the bike, I was like. It's not him. It's too obvious. He, really? Oh, too I guess obvious. yeah. Yeah, that part, and then also on the last episodes when when it was like, there's way too much time left still in the show. Like they don't need this much time to wrap it up. There's gonna be another twist, right? It's too. Yeah. It was one of those. It's too easy moments. Yeah. Um, well, we've been talking with Gabriela Burgos for the from the from the Film Posers podcast, which I subscribe to. I make sure every you guys are all listening <laughs> to their, their to their takes. Um, they also do occasional videos on YouTube as well, so make sure that you guys are following them. Um, and uh, one last thing that I like to do with my guests, uh, okay. Gabriela, is to try to find out a little bit about them and then do something that we like to call the bracket bit. Right, it is time for bracket bit. This is where the bracket bit is created for maximum pain. And what we want to do is give you I actually have two short bracket bits for you today. Okay. Because I did a little research on you and I asked and I said, what are two things that she's into? And then one thing that's relevant to the conversation today. So what is gonna happen is I create these bits, they're both 16 teams, which you know I'm gonna give you two of them and you tell me which one moves on. I create the bracket bit for my own reasons, but you can solve it with whatever process you want. You okay. can tell me which of these two things you like the most, which one you would rather be see more of, which one you would rather watch right now, or which one you think is the better character, depending on the bit. Okay? okay. But so it's up to you. And away we go. The first bracket bit that we're gonna do, since we were talking about the mayor of East Town, is famous mayors and t and presidents from TV and film. So I'm gonna give you two famous mayors, or ma this is mayors versus presidents. Okay. Okay. You ready to go? All right. We got yeah. Mayor Quim Mayor Quimby, the mayor from The Simpsons, or Cl Claire Underwood, the president from that one Netflix show that we don't talk about anymore. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> what is that with that Kevin Spacey was on? What's the name of it? I don't yeah. remember. Uh, House of Cards. House of Cards, right. So we got Mayor Quimby or Claire Underwood. Oh. Huh. Okay. So I love Robin Wright, so I'm gonna just go with Claire Underwood. <laughs> Claire Winded. All right. Selena Mayer, who played the, the, the Veep as well as the president yeah. in Veep, or the mayor from Jaws, who told everybody it was safe to get into the water. Politics. <laughs> it's Real politics. life politics. Yeah, it's the politics. Eh? It's kind of like the mayors that said open everything up, right? It's safe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Uh, the, choice, the choice is yours. Selena Meyer. Selena Meyer. The mayor from Portlandia. We never knew their name, but they were always in quirky situations. Or James Dale, 
who was played by Jack Nicholson, which was the president from Mars Attacks, one of my favorite movies. James Dale, obviously. James Dale has to move on. Dwayne Elizondo Mountain Dew Herbert Camacho, the president from Idiocracy, or from Family Guy, Mayor Adam West. God, I've never seen either of those. Okay, well, one of them is... Well, you never seen Idiocracy? Oh, okay. Well, uh, he's played by the dude from Brooklyn Nine Nine. Uh, I forget and, his name. And December? No, no, the big buff back guy. What's his? I forget. His oh, name. yeah, from White Chicks. Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah, he, he plays the he plays the the president in a uh, in a universe that's uh, not unlike our own, or the 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 uh, fictional mayor Adam West from the Family Guy universe. Okay, so I don't like Family Guy, so. All right. Let's move in. Dwayne Elizondo, Mountain Dew, Herbert Camacho, the president. All right. And then uh, Dave, which was a movie back in the 90s. I don't know if you catch it about the the, uh, the the double for the president that ended up becoming the president. And then Tommy Carsetti, who played, uh, who was also in Game of Thrones, but he played the mayor of Baltimore in the show The Wire. So we got President Dave or Mayor Tommy Carsetti? Tommy Carsetti. All right. James Marshall uh, from uh, Air Force One, played by... Uh, Harrison Ford. Harrison Ford, or Mariah Carey, who played the mayor of Lego Batman. God, I love Lego Batman, Mariah Carey. <laughs> Leslie Nope from Parks and Rep. She also went on to become president in some of the future episodes. Or Johnny Papas, who played, uh, who was played by Al Pacino in an underrated movie of his, City Hall. Leslie Nope. Hey, Leslie, nope. And we have Jed Bartlett, the president from the West Wing, or uh, Coriella... Uh, Coriolanus. Coriolanus, no. Uh, from um, the, Hunger the, young, the Hunger Games. Yeah. God. I can't say no to Jed Bartlett. <laughs> Jed Bartlett. All right, we're moving on. Uh, Claire Underwood or Selena Meyer? Claire. Uh, James Dale, uh, Jack Nicholson from Mars Attack, or Dwayne Elizondo? James. Tommy Carsetti, or Mayor Maria, Mariah Carey? Mariah Carey. <laughs> Leslie Nope, or Jed Bartlett? Darn it. <laughs> Once again, the bracket bit is uh, created to, cr- to cause maximum pain for scientific purposes for my guests, so take your time. Take us behind your thought process. You know, Leslie Nope is funny. But also, Jed Bartlett, a wise man. Jed Bartlett is a wise man. It's one of the best written TV shows in all time. It also brings up Sorkinisms, where Aaron Sorkin wrote the same thing in West Wing, and then he kept using the same thing over and over in other shows. But still a great show. No, let's just go with Jed Bartlett. All right, so we're going with uh, Jed yeah. Bartlett? Yeah. Uh, actually, moving right along. All right, getting to the nitty-gritty. James Dale, President, Mars Attack, Jack Nicholson, Claire Underwood, President, House of Cards, Robin Wright. Yeah, Claire. Claire Underwood. <laughs> Mariah Carey? Oh, no, from- God, no. Or Jed Bartlett? That's a tough one. It's just that Jed Bartlett is so well written. And Mariah Carey in Lego Batman, it's just, she's just there. And it's just funny that she's the mayor. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that that is kind of like, you know, what are you going for? Substance or, or, or cool factor it's here? It's funny. <laughs> yeah, it is funny. Jed. Jed Bartlett. That's going to bring up two very well written, powerful presidential figures. In the battle of mayors versus presidents, you, you chose presidents. And it comes down to this. Claire Underwood, backstabbing, conniving, murdering, not only dirt or murder, but murder, murder. Uh, <laughs> incredibly played by, uh, by Robin wow. Wright. Uh, Jed Bartlett, wise, paternal figure, well written by Sorkin, you know, sort of Joe Biden if he was 40 years younger, maybe, sort of, sort of thing, right? <laughs> basically basically he's like he's like a combination of what we really would want a president to be um, uh, okay so we gotta go down who would who would give rights to immigrants 
Okay. All right. Let's 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 go on a on a, on a let's go let's go deep here. Let's go. Let's yes yes, because side note, the Biden administration talked all this shit about the first hundred days, saying they were going to set up a, a path. They were said they said path to citizenship, fix the dreamers, uh, and and, yeah. and 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 temporary stays. Now they said if you had a temporary stay but you came into the country illegally, you cannot get a green card. They have not acted on the Dreamer Act, and they said some bullshit like they want bipartisanship to find out what the immigration process is, which is all a load of fucking bullshit. Yeah. It's more Obama era politics with deportations and shit like that. Kamala Harris told the other day people in Central America to stay the fuck home. Yeah, where? Oh god. And they and they think that just by sending money to Central America, they're gonna protect people from gangs. Who the fuck do you think is gonna get the money that you sent? Where do you think the money that the U.S. is gonna send to Guatemala, to Central America, is gonna go to? Who do you think it's going to get distributed to the people that are like the gangs are killing you, or do you think maybe in a corrupt Central American country, country that it might be going to the wrong hands? Exactly. I... Side political like... rant over. I apologize, but thank you for, no, for allowing us to go deep there. You're ab- you're absolutely right, and I fully agree. It was something that's just like God. You know, you created the the reasons why so many people have to leave their countries mm-hmm. so you know it's practically their fault so I don't yeah it's so easy vote on puerto rico statehood vote on dc no. statehood get four extra senators yeah. in there absolutely no statehood for puerto rico no really no You're, really absolutely not no all right this seems like a hot take tell me about it no it's not a hot take actually Okay, no, that because we're, like I I love to hear it because from what I've seen, it seems like a pretty obvious step to do it. What is the reason that tell educate me? Okay, so the U.S. took ownership on us back in 1898 when they invaded us. Well, it wasn't exactly in 1898, but it was like right after that, mm-hmm. and so we got U.S. citizenship so we could fight in World War One because they needed more soldiers. So they were like, okay, I'm just let's just give them the citizenship and use them for the war. And then the veterans were like, absolutely never going to recognize them. And then they, the birth control pill exists because they conducted illegal experiments on Puerto Rican women. And they illegally sterilized Puerto Rican women without their consent and without them knowing until years later. They tested bombs and weapons and, you know, like this thing called Agente Naranja, which is kind of like the smoke. That's illegal, by the way. It's not allowed to be used. And they tested it here. And there are still bombs in Vieques, which is one of the islands that we we are in archipelago. So there are still bombs in Vieques that haven't been able to be removed, that they could still go off. And the cancer rates in Vieques are of the charts due to the radiation that the people were exposed to while the U.S. Army occupied that island illegally, and so there was this huge march for it for it to be for them to retreat. And even Jimmy Smith went to that march. Like I wasn't born yet, but good times. Okay. <laughs> and so that there's also how they created La Ley de Mordaza, where we couldn't wave our flags for a for like. 10-ish years, something like that. I don't remember when it ended, but basically they created this law that we couldn't wait, like show our flag, our own flag. We couldn't do it, which is why when they say, oh, Puerto Ricans always wear their flag and have their flag everywhere. Yeah, because for a long period of time, we couldn't show our flag because the U.S. forbade us from doing it. And it was mostly due because the independence movement here started getting a lot of traction. And... They were like, no, no, this can't happen. Like, we can't allow the people to think to like think that independence is a, is like an, a viable option. And so, you know, they killed and they threw in jail so many of our independent movement people. And there was also how the Statue of Liberty was occupied by Puerto Rican demanding independence. That was also they tried to erase that. Think- so you're saying that the that even though the the narrative that we hear mostly is that that 
that adding statehood to Puerto Rico and, and, and District of Columbia would give give enough of a and, and there's also the assumption that the senators would be it's democratic, ridiculous. right? It's ridiculous. You know, if you come to Puerto Rico You say that the majority of people don't want that. No, we don't because it's it's ridiculous. We've spent so many years suffering under the power of the United States. Do you seriously think we want to be united at them permanently? Absolutely not. The reason why we have the debt is because of them. You know, and they didn't even bother to like offer debt relief. They just gave us La Junta, which is even worse. Basically, there's like this fiscal group of people that control the money of Puerto Rico. And so there have been budget cuts to literally everything. You no, know, they like our state university lost millions of dollars. It's in danger of losing its accreditation. You know, the the education system is just a disaster. You no. Know, and now it's all thing. And so, no, absolutely not. Like I'm, I, it's going to be hard because again, the thing about it's also our government tries to make sure that they don't know that to make because independence, the history of the independence movement of Puerto Rico is also not taught in schools. It's not mentioned as much. It's a very, very delicate stuff and it's also very sensitive i know about it because i grew up because my family is independent they believe in independence so i grew up with that history i grew up knowing but obviously well, not a lot remember, of people know. i remember the visuals of the puerto ricans taking over the 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 statue of liberty um, and i remember that but i don't the but Congress so, one? have you ever yeah, seen when yeah lola rodriguez de tío Okay, I guess I guess the thought process is that that having the four extra allegedly democratic senators, et cetera, would push enough to help that. I guess that's what I'm not saying. Obviously, you're on the ground there, so you would know better than me. But what I'm saying is that you're saying that even though that's the thought process that people have to make themselves feel good about that, the reality of it is that the people don't really want that, and they would no, rather be in a better. It's not, and also, like basing your argument for wanting statehood for Puerto Rico, just to just gain to fix something else, just to be like, oh, we're gonna gain more vote, we're gonna get like democratic vote. Like, first of all, have you been to Puerto Rico? Have you seen our politicians? Right. Do you seriously think they're gonna be Democrats? To assume that they're gonna be Democrats <laughs> is, is yeah. absolutely not. You know that the, goes along with the, the the thinking that the that the that the Latino community is a monolith that moves together, no, where it's individual no. sectors that completely and, are different. You know, it, it's it's disgusting. Like it's disgusting how they want to push statehood into us. You know, the other day this happened, and like I remember, I didn't find out about this until two days or before it happened. And I have a friend that found out the exact date it happened, and it was just. We were so mad. Basically, they held a special election here, you know, with money that somehow the fiscal group approved to have this because this was deemed necessary. That they had an election to select the six people that will go to the United States Congress to finally bring statehood to Puerto Rico. A secret what? election. No, it wasn't secret. It was just that. It wasn't promoted like you would promote like a general election. It was just like, hey, so we're doing this. And I, the thing is that I kept seeing a lot of commercials being played about voting. And I was so confused because, you know, we the midterms aren't until there's still a few years until the next elections. Why are there so many commercials about the ele elections playing? And then I found out about it and I was so pissed because one of the candidates was Ricardo Rosselló, whom, if you know... He was the one we kicked out back in the summer of 2019. Okay. So what's even more disgusting is that he won. Hmm. And so he's going to bring statehood to Puerto Rico. And, right. And so, no, absolutely not. <laughs> I'm waiting for the day that we get independence so that I can eat my American citizenship. Because when they ask me what I am, I say Puerto Rican. I never say that I'm American. Never. I don't identify with the culture. That is not my culture. My culture is the Puerto Rican culture. And if we become state, that's going to be lost. That is an interesting take. I I, I, I appreciate uh, yeah. you. I'm very uh, passionate about it. 
Because no, no, thank you. I, I look, you know, listen. I, I know we came on to talk about a a, 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 a stupid TV show when it when it relates to other things that are in the real world, but this is called Fireside Chats with Big Chief Burrito for a reason. I started it doing, you know, I, I love to talk. I love to hear my spell too. You could probably figure that out. Uh, I also like to have interesting conversations with interesting people and people that know more about another subject than I do. So I absolutely appreciate the fact that you're that you that you're giving us some facts that you're educating me. Um, as like I said. The narrative that we see or that's, I guess, in general here is the complete opposite of that, is that yeah. that statehood would bring a lot of things uh, to Puerto Rico, et cetera. But you are right in that if you identify as such as the culture, you don't identify as American, you've been invaded, you're getting some of the benefits and you're getting like a little pittance here and like relief. And then they're throwing bounty towels at you. And then, you know, and then all the corruption and stuff, um, obviously, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, obviously, you know, that, I, under I understand. I, as, you know, there's a special place in hell for Donald Trump. That's all I'm saying for what he, how he treated us after Maria. He left, I, us, to uh, he left us to die. No, we lost 4,000 people and people still haven't recovered from it. And that was almost four years ago. So I got lucky. Me and my family got lucky, but so many people didn't. And that's just, you know, I don't think I have it in me to like praise and be want to be called part of a country that doesn't really give a shit about us. Because if you ask Americans, so many people don't even know that we exist. <laughs> now I go to the States and I get called Mexican. And when I said I'm from Puerto Rico, I was like, what? <laughs> no, yeah, I like, you know, and for Latinos are all Mexicans in the United States. No, listen, I'm, I'm a Colombian. I'm, I'm Colombian and Uruguayan, right? I grew up okay. in New York, surrounded by, in Queens, uh, went to the, you know, Puerto Ricans, Dominicans, Ecuadorians. Every, every, every Latino culture has their own neighborhood in Queens. It's just a fact. Mm -hmm. And and you make a right turn and you suddenly you're in an Indian neighborhood and then you make a left and you're in a Chinese neighborhood. So yeah, so we we get the benefit of growing up in that area of that in that little perspective. When I came out to San Diego in California, I was a Mexican. You know that that's it. Might as well I called myself might as well be Mexican because I was brown and I was in Southern California inside. Even though I got the the Uruguayan and the Colombian tattoos, I, I just branded myself so I could say I'm not. But 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 I'm very very entrenched in the Mexican culture in Southern California. You know, I, I named my company 2AM Burrito, which is a Southern California Mexican thing, uh, just because it's silly. Um, and and so I, I, I embrace the the unity of the Latino Latinx culture, but I also understand the need for the individual, you know, our individual factions to be able to represent themselves and um, govern themselves as they see fit. You know, so if you don't want to be, you know, so if, if, if Puerto Rico want, you know, it needs to be its own nation like Cuba, like like all the other Caribbean uh, islands, then 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 we're obviously for that. Like, well, I, I, what I was trying to say is that it's interesting to talk to somebody on the ground that's actually living in experience, because the narrative that we hear from the media and a lot of big sources is that is the opposite. So that's why I'm glad that that you uh, that you stopped and said, no, wait a minute. Hold on a second. Hold up. Wait a minute. Lou, you got to stop. Let me get this out because you're, 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 you're wrong. And I appreciate So I appreciate that, yeah, that, because, that you did that. Okay. Because I think that the reason why the media is like, yes, yeah, statehood, it's because every year for the last like five years. Yeah. When I, I voted for the first time in 2016, so that was the first time I had a, I had to vote on this, and it's called a referendum, and it's basically there's this when you go to vote, obviously you vote for governor and mayor and all that, and you get another ballot that says if you want independence, yes or no. Every year every election or sometimes they even do it not even on an election year you're like we're gonna prove that the puerto ricans once won this statehood so every year i've gone and every year i voted absolutely not <laughs> and the thing is that independence isn't isn't even an option on this ballot because we are because the government that has been in control for the last eight years has been the 
statehood party. So they want to make sure that there's absolutely no mention of independence here. So the thing about it is that more because they say that, oh, like half, like 50 percent of the of Puerto Ricans voted for independence. And it was like Puerto Rico lived, we live like around four million people, more or less. So only about less than a million voted yes for statehood but they take that into consideration because not a lot of people vote in the elections here because people are just so frustrated that they don't go to vote which i understand but i vote because I, it's my right at least i'm trying to do something try to change things so not a lot of people go to vote here so when they take into numbers the people that voted yes for statehood right, right. it looks as if it were 50 percent of the population because like 32% of the people voted. So it's okay. a complete lie to make you think that, yes, half the, of the Puerto Ricans want statehood. And then when they do the referendums that are held like on random years, only like 5% of the population shows up to vote. So obviously they're like, yeah, like 75% yeah. of the population wants statehood because those That's are the ones that can vote. They can verify my identity so I can buy Dogecoin, but they haven't figured out how to let people vote through an app. It's not that hard. It's 2021. We should be able to get there, there's no way more voting is not make voting easier for people. Make voting a whole week. Let people yeah. vote by phone. Let's do something yeah. so people are more actually voting. something that I did not know was a thing in the US because here the elections day is a holiday. Like everyone has it's, it's, you know, yeah, everyone's off. Yeah. Unless you're like obviously like an essential worker or any of that, but still like you get the time. Like I, I know I know like I have a, I have a lot of friends that I used to work at Walgreens, and yeah. Walgreens was like okay, so pick a time when you can go to vote and then come back to work, or you can always like vote like vote like earlier. But here, early voting you have to request it. You can't just show up early voting. You have to request it. So oh, here it's on a it's on a Tuesday. It will and you and you have yeah. to ask you have here to ask for a day off. And guess me, and guess what? Guess what? Who are the people who more than not likely would have hourly jobs where taking four hours out on a Tuesday might make them might they might be, you know, they might not want to ask their boss, hey, I need four hours off on Tuesday so I can go vote. These are mostly minorities that have hourly jobs and jobs that that that. They, they can't take, I'm going to take the afternoon off, Chad, so I can go vote. And then I'm going to have lunch mm -hmm. at the club. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's a whole system of uh, voter it repression, is. voter suppression, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I, I It is uh, it is interesting. I'm trying to figure out how good of an interviewer I am because I'm trying to figure out a segue back to the bracket bit that we were doing. Since okay, we got let's all... <laughs> see, if any, any of these presidents would give yeah, so for yeah, independence... Back. Which one? Which one would give Puerto Rico its independence after a long, like a sixty-minute thing? Like there was an incident with like a nuclear bomb on the island, then it went off, and then they had to fly in some things, and there was like a whole press conference, and 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 this president gets up to the podium and says, "Listen, enough with this already. We're gonna make Puerto Rico, Puerto Rico. You can go do whatever you want." <laughs> which is the president that says that, in your opinion? <laughs> I don't know. I I think Claire Claire Underwood is a Republican. Yeah, true. <laughs> so that's out of the question. <laughs> so I think Jed Bartlett might be like the best. All right, Jed Bartlett. All right, this this bracket bit took an entire left turn where we went on a political rant for like twenty five minutes, but I loved it. Thank you. I, I mean, uh. Thank, like again, honestly, thank you for expressing that because I always want to, you know, hear facts from people that are actually living it. So it's awesome. So Jed Bartlett wins our mayor versus president's bracket <laughs> bit. All right, I want to end on something fun. I do know that you're a fan of Keanu Reeves. Oh my god! <laughs> right? Yeah. And we all know the one good thing about hanging out with Keanu during a pandemic is that he always makes you a mask because Keanu weaves. Oh sorry, sorry, God. sorry. Okay, sorry. I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> I love how how that how I love how that's literally when people meet me in person. Like, oh, you're like the Keanu Reeves girl. I'm like, 
Yeah. All right. All right. So one last bit for today so we can end on a happy note. All right. Okay. Uh, the With uh, Gabriela from the Film Posers, she, we talked about Mayor of Easttown. We talked about uh, Puerto Rico independence. Uh, we talked about movies, TVs in general. So I had a, a, I hope you had a good time. I had a great time. Yeah. Uh, but like I said, one of the things that just kept popping up when I was like, let me let me find out a little bit about Gabriela so I can so I can do my bracket bit. What's your love of Keanu Reeves movies? So our last bracket bit of the day is going to be Keanu versus Keanu. All right. Oh I picked 16 God. Keanu rolls. We're going to see which one makes it to the end. All right. You ready? Yes. All right. We got Mr. Thomas Anderson, also oh, known no. as Neo from The Matrix, or a very, I remember going on a date with a girl to watch this, Mr. Keanu from A Walk in the Clouds. Oh, I love A Walk in the Clouds. Neo Keanu or Rom? Uh, that's not a rom com. It's more of a, a rom. Drama. A dramatic a drama. drama. A dramedy, yes. Walk in the Clouds. Oh, my God. I. Versus Neo. <laughs> <laughs> they both have their perks. Right. One of them's in the Matrix and the other one is uh right. oh a, I mean oh. like Neo's technically dead, so <laughs> hey the, like I said, I create the bracket, you whatever methodology you want to use and reasoning and thought process. You can even say which one would win in a fight in the real world. Whatever you want. Whatever your decision is, you tell me who moves on. Mm -hmm. Walk in the Clouds, Keanu, or Neo, Keanu? I'm, I'm thinking about which of those movies I have seen the most times. <laughs> well, The Matrix has three oh, films, right? Yeah. The Matrix is one of my all-time favorite films. Part three with the guy with the uh, with the colonel talk and that eight hours oh, about believing you have a choice is having a choice, but if you don't have, a I choice, don't. I don't like to talk about the third one. That's all right. Yeah, it's all right. All right. Third Matrix, third suppress, third uh, Godfather didn't happen. Yeah, I'm gonna go with a walk in the clouds. I'm a heathen. A walk in the clouds <laughs> yeah. and an upset in the first round. A walk in the clouds. Keanu takes a walk to the second round. One of my favorite uh, Keanu performances, uh, narcoleptic. In my own private Idaho, love that uh, movie. with River Phoenix, classic indie yes. film, or culturally appropriating Keanu as Kai in the Forty Seven Ronin. I mean, <laughs> Keanu is Asian, so it wasn't a Pro problematic Keanu. I'm just kidding. Uh, it's uh, it's Kai a bad from movie. Kai it's from Forty Seven Ronin or uh, indie Keanu from this my own private Idaho. This one's easy. Obviously, my own private Idaho. My own private Idaho. That's one of my favorites. Uh, Donnie Barksdale from The Gift. Oh. So, like, uh, Mystical Keanu or Johnny Mnemonic from Johnny Mnemonic. Uh, the Gift is so bad. Mm. It is very bad. Johnny Mnemonic. Even though Johnny it's not as good, but at least he wasn't a racist like Donnie and The Gift. <laughs> Uh, Jonathan Harker from Bram Stoker's Dracula. Oh, so the spooky. horrible, the horrible British accent. How can we? Uh, oh man! Uh, or Kevin Lomax from the uh, or lawyer Keanu. The devil's advocate. The devil's advocate. Tempted by the devil, Keanu, or tempted by Dracula, Keanu. <laughs> Just Jonathan Harker. That was such a horrible performance. <laughs> he said, hey man, he was coming off of Bill and Ted. You know, he was like, "Hey, you want to be in a Dracula? Yeah, I'll be in a Dracula." Man. Okay. Kevin Lomax, but only because I like Devil's Advocate more than Dracula. Devil's Advocate. All right, that's fine. Ted Theodore Logan. No. Or John Constantine. So we have time traveling, Lo time traveling Keanu, or uh, fighting the devil Keanu. Which he kind of did in Devil's Advocate as well, but hmm. no. Can I plead the fifth? <laughs> you can phone a friend if you'd like. <laughs> no, if, if I phone a friend, it's going to be very divisive. It's going to okay. be like 50 50 because I have friends that love <laughs> Bill and Ted. I have friends that love Constantine. It's going to be right down the middle. Mm. Huh. Okay, so I'm going to go again with which one have I seen the most, and that's Constantine. Constantine. John Constantine. Yeah, Bill and Ted. Constantine. I'm excited to see the next Bill and Ted, though. I'm it's really lie. good. Like It definitely yeah. lives up to. Because yeah. I love the first one. The second one I really don't like as much, but the third one managed to combine what made both movies good. Mm -hmm. It's really good. I really liked it. Is it on Is it, is it on demand or Hulu? or? Where, I think or you can where? rent it. Okay. God, I'm going to have to check it's that really one out. Good. It was a one right. from last year. 
Shane Falco. This is a tough one for me. Shane Falco versus Johnny Utah. Where was Shane Falco from? The replacements. He was. Oh. Uh, he was a. He was a quarterback that was yeah. a replacement player, or yeah. he was a FBI agent that was a former football player. Oh. Make it two, Utah. Oh, Make no. it two. Yeah, the the replacements is like my dad's favorite movie. Hmm. But I love Point Break. That's one of my favorites. So I'm a surfer. Like- Point Break, Johnny yeah. Utah moves on to I the second round. Make it two, Utah. Make it two. Utah. Uh, Don John from Much Ado About Nothing or the Neon Demon? Don John. Don John. Keep cashing those paychecks, Bill Keanu. Keep- I swear, I have given that man so many royalties. <laughs> <laughs> All right, here we go. Big favorite in this bracket, John Wick. Versus one of Keanu, the one of Keanu's early roles that put him on the bat, Jack Traven from Speed. What do you do? What do you do? This one's so easy for me. It's John Wick. John Wick. All right, it's John too Wick. Too easy Jack. for me. Yeah, that's why I left. That's why I left him for last because I figured we'll put John Wick at the bottom of the bracket to disguise the fact that it's going to be tough. But there's some pretty other, there's some iconic Keanu roles here. I mean, we're gonna we're gonna figure it out. But John Wick versus Don John. John, oh, John Wick. John Wick. John Constantine or Johnny Utah. Oh, fun fact! I actually did a PowerPoint ranking all the Johns because Keanu has played so many John characters that I have. I did a PowerPoint presentation to like figure out who was the best John. Really? Amazing. Yes. Ooh. Wick. Uh, right. It was a tie between John Wick and Johnny Utah. Classic. Yeah. Because I did well, it as if they were Tinder profiles. It was this whole thing. <laughs> this sounds awesome. It was. <laughs> <sighs> okay. So, Constantine... I love to geek out about movies, roles, and stuff like that. So, yeah, obviously, I'm down for that. That's awesome. Well, John Constantine or Johnny Utah? This is back at it. Take us through your thought process. Bust out the PowerPoint if you have to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I thought like the I thought you here's the downside of Constance is that he's he's a chronic smoker, that he, you know. Mm-hmm. And then Utah is that he's a workaholic and that he's obviously in love with Patrick Swayze. So that's gonna be a conflict of interest if he's in love with Patrick Swayze. This is the whole thing that I that I say no, about the break. Absolutely. I can see it's a love. I can see it as a love story. It's a love story. <laughs> it's anyway. a love, you know how can how else can you explain he him? him go. He, he, he jumps. Go. He jumps after him without a parachute, knowing uh, he was going to uh, catch him. Yeah. If I was on a plane and it was only two parachutes and it was me, my girlfriend, and out of the armas. <laughs> Oh my god! (laughs) I'm sorry. I'm sorry. The joke was right there. I couldn't. I could not make it. I'm sorry. That's wrong. That's wrong. I don't know. I don't know. I'm gonna marry that girl. Congratulations. Thank you. (laughs) All right. The question reminds: John Constantine or Johnny? Oh, the thing is that I've seen. Constantine and Point Break like the same amount of times. So mm-hmm. in terms of rewatchability factor, we're we're stuck here. We are mm-hmm. we're coming to standstill. Do you do you, do you flip a point in that scenario? If if you're like uh, again the Snowden New York scenario, you got two DVDs to to pass two hours. You know, right now, like what are you popping in? Right now. Yeah. When I, when I always get stuck on some of these, I say, if I was going to watch a movie right now or if I was going to, you know, do something right now, which of these two things would I do or which okay. one would I watch, you know? It's kind of like that flip a coin in the air. When it's in the air, you'll realize what mm-hmm. you're hoping for. So if you say right now, Constantine, because I haven't seen it in a while. Okay. Hey. Constantine. Constantine moves on. Yeah. Johnny Utah. Johnny Mnemonic or Kevin Lomax. Kevin Lomax, because I like that movie more. Okay. A Walk in the Clouds. No, Keanu, oh God. Or My Own Private Idaho. So Indy Keanu or Dramedy Keanu. I'm Dramedy. Drama Keanu. Drama. drama Keanu. Rome, drum Drama. Rum Drama. A Walk in the Clouds. A Walk in the Clouds. And then Kevin Lomax or Mr. Walk in the Clouds. Devil Keanu or Romantic Keanu. Devil Keanu. 
A walk in the clouds. <laughs> walk in the clouds. A walk in the clouds. Busting through this bracket, going through all covers. All right. And then in this one, which I think is uh, probably the only tough competition here for Mr. John, another battle of the John, Constantine or Wick? Wick. Wick. So here comes Keanu. Oh, God. With his, with his jug of fresh wine. You know, in his little white puffy shirt with his khakis, and he's walking along. And then here pulls up Keanu in this Mustang with his pit bull next to him and uh, and a nine. And they face off, and, you know, John Wick's got to decide whether he's going to shoot romantic Keanu in the head and win this bracket. You know what? You, or... wouldn't, you wouldn't shoot romantic Keanu because he didn't <laughs> harm his dog. No, because the dog would run up to Keanu and he would like feed it some grapes, but then the grapes would kill the dog. I'm just kidding. How dare wait, wait, you? Wait, wait. Sorry, sorry, never. Sorry. <gasps> don't, feed, don't feed your dogs grapes. Is the, no. is the point of that story? Um, <laughs> but, but again, uh, Gabriela, I, I appreciate you uh, that I reached out to you and you decided to come on uh, to do this uh, mayor podcast. But also, I, I, I'm glad that you came on and stayed on for a while and talked about your life as a film critic um, and. Uh, your experiences uh, in Puerto Rico as well. So I want to thank you, number one, for that. I want to make sure everybody goes and watches the uh, and listens to the Film Posers podcast. Um, and, um, and I also want to say that uh, Keanu versus Keanu has been a really fun bracket. I'm glad we could end it on a funny note. So that being said, you are the fan. You are the critic. We look forward to seeing what you do uh, as you move on. And, and I want to see, you know, what you, what you guys write, produce, etc. But right now, you got two movies in front of you and only one right answer. This feels like America's Next Top Model. And we'll have the answer right after this. Okay. Um, it, yeah. I mean. It's just it's so two completely different characters. Right. As they say in the Highlander, there can be only one. Now, this doesn't lessen your love of any one of these two movies. This just happens to be who wins this particular bracket. A walk yeah, in a cloud, Keanu, has breezed through this. It was it's it, it's an underrated film of his, you know. It's one of my favorites. Some, features some great ranking. scenery. I have a list on Letterbox ranking his entire filmography. So I guess it is a good matchup against, you know, action Keanu, Keanu yeah. that went to like uh, gun school and like assassin school for like eight months. Like this is like new, like respectful Keanu that won't put his hand <laughs> on a woman's back when he's taking a picture. This is like evolved Keanu versus young up and coming romance Keanu, you know? I'm going to have to go with John Wick. John Wick. All right, that's why he was the number one rated uh, here. I put him at the bottom because I know you're a huge fan. I so am. obviously, obviously, obviously. I, I hope I hope you had I hope you had fun during those brackets, yeah, though. They, they good. <laughs> that was good. Uh, but yeah. once again, um, you know, you've said you've said enough. We did an hour and fifty minutes here. Uh, we'll put this up on the as a podcast uh, within the next day or so, and I'll, I'll let you know when that's up. Uh, but yeah, but again, um, you know. The best of luck with you guys on on, on your podcast, yeah. the in your in your career, you as well as your group, because I think I want to have uh, all you guys on at one point and just kind of talk to your group as a whole in terms of like young filmmakers and young film reviewers. Uh, but but we look forward to seeing what you what you do in the future. We uh, wish you the best of luck in your move to New York. Uh, and uh, again, thanks for coming on the show. Yeah, thank you. This was so much fun. Thank you for having me. No, no problem. All right, so I'm going to do my outro, and I'll be back to say goodbye in, like, 30 seconds, all right? Okay. All right, guys, thank you for watching. Thank you, Gabriela. Go follow her, the Film Posers uh, podcast, and ciao.